Hi folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse, where we talk about movies, music, art, and culture. And today we're taking another retrospective look at an album that came out earlier this year. Monomania by Deer Hunter. But first, let me talk to you about a pet peeve of mine. When people say that the lyrics don't matter. Now, I've gotten this comment from a number of people. It's often followed by, I just listen to the music. I don't care about the lyrics. And you know... There's a bit of an argument there. Arguably, the musical composition should be what we get behind. The instrumentation, the production that composes the elements of the song, the strength of the vocalist delivery when singing. And a lot of critics have done very well in the field of describing what works and what doesn't about said compositions, pointing out the individual elements that come together to, to create that music. But here's my huge problem with this. The lyrics are still part of the song. Somebody still sat down and wrote them to fit the instrumentation, or composed the instrumentation to fit with the lyrics. If the lyrics didn't matter at least a little to the artist, why didn't they just fill the vocals of their track with vocal gymnastics or general incoherence? Why didn't they just use nonsense words if the lyrics don't matter? Well, the thing is, and this is important, most musicians do care about the lyrics. It's arguably the most straightforward way in which they can communicate their message. Sure, you can draw interpretations from instrumentation, particularly through the consideration of contextual sampling and discuss the emotions and thoughts that the artists are trying to evoke, but the most direct way in which they are communicating their message are through the lyrics. And as a critic, it should be my role to interpret, explain, and analyze that message and how it is presented. You know, do some legwork in discerning the artistic intent, and then explaining whether or not the execution of said intent actually worked. But far... Far too often, I've seen too many critics fall into the trap of just describing what the music is. They talk about the sound that the music creates and maybe scratch the surface of the message informed by the lyrics. And even then, that particular uh, deeper analysis is cursory at best. That's not being a critic, that's being an observer with a thesaurus. And I'll admit, this underlying peeve of mine is why I tend to have a, a lot more acceptance for country and pop music than most. Sure. The lyrics might be shallow or vapid or incredibly stupid, but at least they matter somewhere in the mix. At least they're important to the composition of the song. And on the same note, a lot of indie rock that opts to bury the lyrics deep at the back of the mix where they're borderline unintelligible really frustrates me. Without lyrical context, I feel like I'm grasping at straws to interpret or criticize the material. And I'm stuck asking the question why they're burying the vocals instead of actually paying attention to the instrumentation. Instead of taking in the entire musical piece, I'm stuck listening for one component. It's not properly balanced. Let me also stress that this is different than dirty vocals. That's a vocal style that's intended to sound threatening or scary. And once you get a handle on how to listen to those particular vocals, the lyrics are often easy enough to make out. But there are some bands who like to bury their lyrics under vocal effects and distortion where I can't make out what they're saying without pulling up the lyrics online. And in those cases, I get why many music critics will just throw up their hands and just talk about the band's sound. So with all that in mind, I was left distinctly dissatisfied when I started going through Deer Hunter's discography in preparation for reviewing their newest album, Monomania, particularly with their debut. It was an album dedicated to their late bassist, Justin Bosworth, and has been repeatedly disowned by lead guitarist, singer, and songwriter, Bradford Cox. We're going to come back to him several times in this discussion. I'm glad he thinks that he doesn't like this album, mostly because putting aside the title this album is goddamn terrible. It is clearly a case of instrumentation trumping over any coherent vocals, and when looking up the lyrics, I could understand why they were buried. They were mostly a load of trite, overwrought teenage nonsense. Fortunately, the band actually did learn from this with their follow-up cryptograms, which cleaned up some of the vocals and was generally a lot stronger. I'll admit that Deer Hunter does a very good job creating expansive psychedelic soundscapes, but in cleaning up the vocals, Deer Hunter exposed the lyrics, which might damage around themes of death and companionship, but really coalesced into anything all that coherent or all that impactful. This is mostly due to Bradford Cox's stream of conscience delivery, where he doesn't write down any of the lyrics and he just goes into the booth and just spews whatever comes off the front of his mind, which can lead to interesting enough ideas, but nothing all that meaningful coming out of it, nothing all that coalesced to actually produce a coherent meaning or thesis statement. Now, the third album, Microcastle, took things a step further and cleaned up the production even more, moving towards an even tighter focus and greater accessibility. Logically, this should make the album my favorite of the three thus far, but the choice has also exposed an uglier theme of the album and something that is more indicative about Bradford Cox's personality. Self-absorption to the point of myopia and paranoia 
and a Peter Pan complex that could rival that of Billy Joe Armstrong. Yes, I get that Bradford Cox has had many brushes with death thanks to his genetic condition Marfan Syndrome, and I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. But his repeated refusals to grow up or properly deal with how his life will inevitably progress shows an astounding lack of maturity. Granted, this attitude was visible on his debut, but it rears its head in a big way on Microcastle, showing how he'd just be most comfortable sealing himself away in his artistic bubble, away from reality or any form of consequence. And you know, this would actually be tolerable if the framing of this individualist vision actually had context or deeper insight or showed an iota of self-awareness. And you know what? For a few moments on Deer Hunter's Weird Era Continued, which was an album that came out in the very same year as a surprise add-on to Microcastle, fragments of that context does actually appear. But it's also on this album that Deer Hunter returned to bad habits and shoved the vocals to the absolute back of the mix again, where it would have been completely impossible to hear. At this point, I nearly threw up my hands and gave up, and if it wasn't for the strong instrumentation, I would have stopped listening to Deer Hunter entirely. Now, fortunately for me, I didn't give up. And good thing too, because their follow-up 2010 album, Halcyon Days, is probably my favorite of their discography thus far. Not only did they make the vocals audible, Cox actually executes a thematic through line surprisingly well. Various associated memories of discovering new music. Sometimes they were thrilling, sometimes they were chilling, but all of which they were emotional and inspired a reaction that had context and made sense. It's one of the few places I argue Cox's stream of conscious lyrics actually do work, because they fit the moment-by-moment -moment flow of the album. Yeah, the album is still self-indulgent as hell at points, but the instrumentation was stronger than ever and Cox showed real signs of improvement. And thus, at the end, before going to Monomania, I was really enthused. Could it be even better than its predecessor and surprise me all the more? Well, no. Let me make this clear, Deer Hunter's new album is okay and does contain a few of my favorite ever songs from the band, but it's far from great and probably won't land on my list of best albums of the year. But that doesn't prevent Monomania from being one of the more intriguing albums to talk about this year, and explaining why it didn't quite click with me is interesting all in its own right. For starters, the majority of typical Deer Hunter traits are on display here. Excellent instrumentation, far, far weaker technical songwriting, and Bradford Cox's myopic self-interest taking center stage once again. However, while on previous albums his vocals were buried behind studio effects and were situated at the back of the mix, this time they've been shoved to the very front and the very top of the mix, and then made mostly ind indecipherable under waves of distortion and static. Don't get me wrong, it's better than previous albums, but it did nothing for my patience and or excuse the fact that I still had to go digging up the lyrics elsewhere. Now, believe it or not, this does represent a stylistic shift for Deer Hunter, and a big one at that. Like the Yeah Yeah Yeah's recent album Mosquito, this album reportedly inspired by a return to their roots of loud, garage-inspired noise rock, and it does the band a lot of credit that they're still able to create memorable and interesting melodies out of this stylistic shift. And unlike their debut, Deer Hunter does manage to convey a lot of attitude and presence in the instrumentation instead of just, you know, amateuristic trash. However, here's where the problems start, and we can point directly at Bradford Cox as the main source. Namely, that whenever Deer Hunter are attempting to sound tough or arrogant or have any sort of sleaze or swagger, it's laughably executed. Try as he might, I just can't buy into Bradford Cox as the sort of singer who could believably sell this sort of material. I'm reminded of Jay Sean's attempt to be seductive on Neon. It's an attitude that just doesn't work for them and renders the attempts at grittier songwriting more than a little hilarious. And with that in mind, I actually found myself liking their more toned down and organic tracks like Penascola and Sleepwalking and Back to the Middle, where Cox seems to be playing with this new brash Americana with at least some self-awareness. But then again, that might be the point. The more I examine the songwriting on this album, the more I notice elements of irony and parody. Dream Captain seems to be a song more invested in gutting Southern rock of its precious masculinity than celebrating it. Blue Agent could be considered to have ambiguous framing, viciously attacking the douchebaggery of the narrator than embracing it. And Night Bike sure as hell seems to me like a takedown of road ballads. Hell, the bonus track Punk seems to completely designed to denigrate the punk musician lifestyle in scathing terms. So okay, Monomania is trying to be a parody album then, ironically targeting and lampooning the traits of the musical style in which they're playing. Hell, I can get behind that. I'd even argue that it makes some degree of sense with the title track and the theme of Monomania, getting so lost in a singular focus or delusion that they lose the necessary context to think or act rationally. So thus, 
thus, by playing said material with a degree of self-conscious irony, Deer Hunter are showing the dangers of completely subsuming to the lifestyle promoted by said material, instead of actually stepping back and taking it with a grain of salt. And if I bought into Bradford Cox's mad genius, I'd even say he had the forethought to make this album just as self-referential about his previous material, which is inspired in a twisted sort of way. But here's the big sticking point for me, and the reason that why even if we do consider Monomania to have parodic intent, I don't think they stick the landing. This is what I call the Beastie Boys Kesha situation, where the material that you present can be read on two different and simultaneously legitimate levels. On the level of celebrating the subject matter, and on the level of ironically making commentary on it. It's a fun balance. It's, you know that Kesha is only pretending to be that drunken party girl on her first album. In the most part, she's actually extremely intelligent, and she's playing it off making fun of those people, and yet celebrating at the same time. The Beastie Boys did it as well. Fight for Your Right to Party is a parody, people. It's not meant to actually be taken seriously. And you know what? On the three songs that I mentioned above that I actually like, you see this balance really working. And the explanation for it, that is actually incredibly simple. Deer Hunter has always been a band with a strong pop sensibility, and it comes out the most in these songs and thus helps them sell them more believably. Hell, most critics were expecting Deer Hunter to go off in a pop direction for this album and maybe have that massive crossover hit. But on most of the rest, there is none of that balance. Coming back to Blue Agent, the lyrics paint the song's narrator as having acrid contempt and monstrous arrogance that any sort of ironic recontextualization just falls painfully flat. And it all gets all the worse when you consider how poorly Bradford Cox is selling this sort of material, with only his delivery providing any trace of ironic detachment, which feels like compensation for poor lyrical subject matter. And with the songs on the more parodic side of the balance, there's little to no humor or levity to balance out the incredibly blunt and simplistic bits of criticism, and the songwriting isn't nearly sophisticated enough to back it up. Compared to Say Anything's vicious song Admit It, lambasting their critics with vitriol and explosive pros, Deer Hunter's winking, quasi-ironic dancing around the issue is just painfully weak. And, as always, this comes back to the songwriting. Because on a technical level, Bradford Cox just isn't good enough to pull off this kind of material. There is a level of finesse required to make this sort of album work, and Cox has never ever had it. I understand why Cox has this stream of conscience delivery, so I guess we're all supposed to be lucky that they make sense at all. But unlike most critics, I'm not gonna buy into this, particularly considering the lyrics have consistently been the weakest part of Deer Hunter's entire discography across the board. And the more I think about it, the reasons that the songs I like on this album work are all the more evidence of instrumental strength carrying the album over mediocre lyrical presence, which could otherwise be rewritten as Deer Hunter's tagline. <sighs> Yet with all that being said, I can't say that I condemn this album outright. Art that fails due to overambition is better in my opinion than art that doesn't even try. And I do appreciate the fact that Cox is actually starting to talk about something other than himself, or pursuing a greater concept. I'll admit that I'll never be the biggest Deer Hunter fan, but I guess if you are, I can recommend Monomania for the moments that do work. Because there are a genuine few that I actually did like. And Bradford Cox. If you happen to see this video, which I doubt you will, I have one bit of advice for you. Write your lyrics down. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I've got a few more reviews on the way. See you next time.